Um, thanks for having me here and thanks for coming to my talk. Um, today, I'm going to talk about brain training. And so the basic concept is that how are we able to kind of take what we know from neuroscience and psychology about you know, how the brain works in order to become you know, more capable with it. And so an analogy is if you look at our understanding of the cardiovascular system and muscle physiology that was developed over the last 100 years or so, this has allowed us to come up with physical fitness approaches that have made athletes stronger and faster and more endurance and able to jump higher. And if we could do the same thing based upon what we know about the brain, there's tremendous potential that could be unlocked. If you look at um, you know, conventional approaches that people use to stay mentally sharp, um, things like Mensa and Sudoku, um, I really liked the Simon game when I was a kid, you know, reading fits in with this, that um, people do engage in activities to try to improve their mental fitness. When people have done studies looking to see the extent to which training with you know, something like crossword puzzles transfers to other activities in the world, um, there have not been very consistent results saying that this is beneficial. And so I'm not saying that there isn't a benefit, but it tends not to transfer to other aspects of cognition as measured. We now have you know, this large crop, it seems like every couple weeks, another company pops up that has neuroscience-inspired games. A lot of these are available on mobile platforms. And there's been a lot of excitement about these because they show that there's some potential that's being unlocked. There's also a lot of controversy in terms of whether they work. So for instance, a few years ago, there was a statement that came from Stanford Institute for Longevity and the Max Planck Institute for Human Development where they essentially stated that if you look at the commercial offer offerings, there's no compelling evidence to date um, that they are effective, especially in terms of reversing cognitive declines with age. Um, at the same time, you know, the punchline of this was that um, you know, it's not that this is not possible. It's that this is something that takes serious research and to figure out you know, how to do right. And the issue that has really faced the field is this issue of specificity. So for instance, there's a lot of different approaches that people use for brain training. So one example task that has been used a lot is a working memory task called the NBAC. And the way the NBAC works is that you have a series of squares that are presented on these screens. In this case, you're supposed to remember the location that was two items back and respond when you see that. So for instance, this one of the little right-hand corner matches what was two items back, that upward in the middle is two items back, and that you could train on this task, and that as you do well, it could move from the two back to the three back to the four back. We've had subjects who even got up to the 15 back, which is kind of scary. And what you find is that people will improve on this task, and so here you see the average of number of groups of subjects where they get from like the three back up to around the six back or so. And there's been a number of studies showing that this um, will transfer to a variety of cognitive tasks that you could test people on. But then you go to the grocery store, you're trying to remember what was this supposed to get, and you know this doesn't seem to transfer. And so this is the big challenge of the field, is how do we come up with a training domain that will show some improvement in that domain, and then when you go in the activities of your daily life, that it's benefiting those as well. And one thing which I will state is that there are two difficulties um, that are principal in the field. One is coming up with the right training approaches, and the other is also how do you measure the proper outcomes? Um, and neither of these are trivial. So when I got into the field, um, what I was really interested in is can we come up with brain training games that have true real world impact? And so the challenge, as I said, is that you train, um, in my case, you know, games typically on a computer or an iPad, and that you want to test something that people do in their daily life and show that there's improvement there. And the first thing which I'll say is that the kind of basic research area that come out of this field of perceptual learning that focuses on how you could improve vision or hearing or touch um, is one that provides some insights that I think are actually are applicable to um, you know, understanding and kind of motivating procedures for the field as a whole. And the basic idea, take the case of vision, is that you know, we have our eyes, we have our brain, and the first observation is that 
vision involves the collaboration between both the eye and the brain. And so there's a huge industry that will you know, provide you glasses or laser surgery um, or various approaches that will improve the optics of the eye. These can improve vision. At the same time, somebody who had a stroke who has damage to the visual cortex will go blind. And so you know, the eyes working well is not enough. You also need to have a brain that is able to effectively processing, process information that comes from the eye. And an interesting case would be um, radiology. So raise your hand if you could find the lytic metastases on um, this image. And so these are like cancer of the bone. And you could look around for a while. Um, and, you know, it's pretty hard. So you could find there's a bunch of different regions that, you know, have been um, verified by a radiologist um, that are spots of cancer. And what's interesting about this is even now that I show you where they are, if I go back, um, you know, it's hard to find them. And once you find something that it's like, yeah, I know that's it, you'll then look around at the image and find something that looks exactly like that that's not cancer. And so with radiologists, they train for years, you know, looking at hundreds of thousands of images. And eventually the visual system is tuned to be able to do this task better. And so this is kind of a good example that, um, you know, through training, um, radiologists are able to see things that they would not have been able to see without training. So the brain is able to improve how it deals with information coming to the eye. In the lab, we typically use more simple stimuli. So you could see that there's like a modulation in this noise that's kind of tilted a little bit to the left, um, centered on these red spots. And as you go to the left, you'll see that they're harder and harder to see. From this, we'll generate what we call a psychometric function so that as a signal strength increases, performance also increases, you can measure this function before training, you can measure the function after training, and eventually what you find is that the same signal strength, people are able to perform better. And this is just kind of a picture of a variety of kind of types of stimuli that people have used perceptual learning for. So you could do acuity, so how small the gap is in the C, or how subtle of a contrast modulation that you could see, or you know, these gratings and noise, or faces and noise, or moving dots, or complex figures, and you could essentially take any um, visual stimulus you can imagine, and there's somebody like me who's done a training study to show that you could get better at that task. Um, other senses as well, so people have trained individuals to um, be better at discriminating wines, and, um, you know, those people afterwards will just spend more money on wine. Um, but, you know, we can improve um, our perceptual ability. The thing which has been fascinating is that in almost all cases, the learning is very specific to the training feature. So take this task where you're discriminating this oriented pattern. And so if you're staring at that little red dot, so the stimulus is shown to the lower right-hand visual field, you could train somebody for a couple of weeks to get better at discriminating that pattern. You then show that same pattern in the upper left-hand visual field. Lo and behold, the learning does not necessarily transfer to that same stimulus, just a different part of the visual field. Other studies show that you, you know, rotate it a little bit. And once again, the learning doesn't transfer. Some of the most fascinating cases, and I've done studies like this, is that you have um, put a patch over one of the eyes. Um, and then you train them where the stimulus is only coming into one of the eyes. And you train them for a couple of weeks, the performance gets better. What happens when you switch the patch from the right eye to the left eye? Well, it's not in every study, but um, in the right cases, the learning actually has to start over. And so even though you do not know which eye the stimulus has come to, that some of these training effects are specific to the eye of stimulation. And, you know, this is something that is fascinating from the scientific perspective, because it gives us clues into what are the brain processes that might be responsible for this highly specific learning. But if you're trying to improve somebody to see better, and I tell you that, okay, come to my lab, and for a month I'm going to train you, and then after that month, if I show you a stimulus in the upper left-hand field of your left eye, you'll be discriminated better. That's not going to really feel that great. Um, instead, you want to be able to see better. And so the thing which I think is important to observe is why is this learning specific? And 
the main reason I'd argue is that people are training with very simple stimuli and that a lot of the studies, the goal isn't to actually get transfer. The goal is to get specificity to understand some aspect of brain processing. But the cost of this is that, um, you know, if you think about any type of learning system, that if you train it with a singular example, it shouldn't generalize to everything else in the world. If you want a learning system to generalize, you actually want to train it on a broad class of examples. And so the first concept that I want to introduce you know, is this concept of a basis function. And um, in this case, it's gonna be a neuro basis function, which is essentially describing how, wh what are the features that the brain pays attention to in order to be able to see. And so if I look at primary visual cortex, so this is the first part of the brain that gets visual information from the eye. So right in the back of the head. And I stick my electrode in, I start recording some cells. The first thing that I'm going to observe is that if I look at neighboring spots in the retina, so this is actually a pattern that was flashed to the eye of a monkey. And here's a rendering of kind of a flattened image of visual cortex. What you see is that you could actually see the pattern of the simulated rings on the visual cortex. Because what's happening is that neighboring cells in the eye project to neighboring cells in the visual cortex. You know, there's some distortion, so it's not like, you know, the pattern looks exactly the same, but the key concept is this concept of retinal copy, that um, there's a map of, in visual cortex that respects the organization of the retina. So basically primary visual cortex has a map of space. The other thing is if I record from one of those neurons and I show it different patterns of light, that some cells will like stimuli like this that's vertically oriented, others horizontally oriented, oriented and others in between. And so across all cells in visual cortex, you find a representation of all orientations, but with each cell typically having a preferred orientation. The other feature is spatial frequency. So what this is describing is kind of how wide these blobs are. So you have some cells that respond to fairly wide blobs, others to more narrow blobs, and What's interesting is that by having individual units that are tuned to these features of, rep of location, orientation, and spatial frequency, it actually represents um, a mathematical concept um, that you could, some people would call it a Fourier transform, but that basically you could take any image and that you could represent that as a set of um, filter responses um, of filters that are tuned to location, orientation, and spatial frequency, which is essentially how your iPhone works. So that JPEG compression, which is one of the more standard um, image compression formats, you take a picture, you put a grid over it, so those are your spatial locations. At each spatial location, you get a um, value for each of these filters of how well it matches the light there, and you get a number from that. If you look at those filters on that top row, you see um, vertical stimuli at different spatial frequencies. Um, on the first column, horizontal different spatial frequencies. And these plaids are like the orientation. And so um, this essentially is giving you um, a set of features that would be appropriate to train on if you actually wanted to generally improve the function of the visual cortex. And so with that, um, I started my first company. We created this game called Optimize. And essentially, it's a very, very simple game where you're blowing up these Gabors because I don't really like Gabors, and so I want to get rid of them. And um, what you see is across these screens is that you have represented different orientations and locations and spatial frequencies. And so we're explicitly trying to train across this basis function um, as you perform the task, they get harder and harder to see. So it's not by accident that, you know, it's really hard to see what's being clicked on because essentially what we do in this game is for every individual, we measure their threshold of visibility and basically personalize the training to them. And so the first piece is, you know, how do you come up with a training that one principally might expect to be able to transfer to vision? And the next part is what we want to do is we wanted to come up with a way that we could test 
performance in the world. And after a lot of thinking, we came up with baseball. So hitting a 100 mile per hour fastball is not an easy task. Um, I'll admit I cannot do it, even with my vision training. Um, but there are people who can. Those people tend to have exquisite vision. So if you look at um, Babe Ruth or Ted Williams, they were both measured to have vision that was about 28. So what this means is what a normal person could read from um, eight feet, they could stand 20 feet back and read. So Babe Ruth was known for being able to read what was written on the ball as it was pitched to him. Um, you know, generally, um, good hitters are able to basically make out the stitching on the ball and use that to detect which way the ball is rotating, which gives them an advantage in being able to predict the trajectory of the ball. And so we took the UC Riverside baseball team and talked with the head coach and said, you know, hey, we want to take your players and put them in a psychology experiment. With a little convincing, we managed to um, get them on board. Um, and although the one limitation was that he told us, you know, we could train the hitters, we could use the um, pitchers as controls. And so this was not a randomized study. Um, and it also was in a relatively small group. Um, but we're really interested in, you know, with baseball is essentially everything is measured. And so there's a large field of sabermetrics that really looks at how you're able to quantify baseball performance. And this allows us to be able to use on-field performance as outcome measures in our study. So what we did is that they came to our lab, they trained for about um, 30 sessions over two months in the fall. Before they did this, we tested their vision with standard eye charts. And so we could see here is this kind of a percent change in viewing distance or equivalent viewing distance. And what we see is between, um, for either far vision or near vision, that the trained players had um, about a 30% change um, in the visibility distance the pitchers who were you know, competing with them to do well in these eye charts show no improvements. This is another measure of vision um, called the contrast sensitivity function. And it addresses the fact that um, you know, when you're viewing you know, subtle stimuli, that the amount of light that you need to be able to um, see it um, depends upon the spatial frequency. And we find that across this function that there's improvements in the trained players. The real question is, you know, how did this affect baseball? And so what we did is that since we didn't have a good control group, we took all the players on um, the UC Riverside team that had played in 2012, the year before we did training, um, and also played in 2013 after training. And so note the, these eye charts were done on um, the post test about a month after we finished training. The baseball season started about three months after we finished training. And what we could do is, look at the year-to-year cha -year change of performance in those players compared to every other player in the competitive league that they were playing with. And so we could look at either change in strikeouts, and we saw was that there was about a 5% reduction in strikeouts year over year for the Riverside team, which was significantly better than the year-to-year -year change in the whole Big West League. And for this one, we actually looked back for every single team year-to-year -year over a five-year period comparing them to the rest of the league. And this was the only time that there's a statistically different um, change um, in one team compared to the rest of the league. And so this is not kind of the usual variation that you just see you know, by chance. Then here we looked at um, kind of runs created. And so this is one of kind of Dale James Moneyball statistics where what you're able to do is look at hitting performance kind of subtracting out fielding performance. And that uh, we found that there was a su substantial change in the Riverside team compared to the Big West League. And what's nice about runs created is that this allows us to use something called the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. And with this theorem, what you're able to do is take runs created and you could compute based upon how many um, runs allowed to the runs that other teams scored on them, how many games they should have won. And um, what we could do with this is that we could take the improvements in runs created with Riverside, we could subtract off that improvement to the rest of the league. And we're able to calculate that this difference led to an increase in wins of 4.7 games out of the 24 game season. And so this is not to say that you know, our training is necessarily responsible 
for every aspect of this improvement. But at least it does demonstrate credibly that you know, training the lab is associated with a real world performance benefit outside the lab. And this is something that you know, tends not to be done in the field. And so kind of this first summary of vision training is that you know, the DALT visual system shows a lot of plasticity. Um, and you just need to recognize that the lab-based studies, they typically are not designed to try to get the most improvement. They're typically telling us something about a learning mechanism. And so if you really want to get real world changes, you need to have a design principle that is going to take you know, a broader understanding of the system, and in this case, this idea of a basis function, and use that to try to get broader transfers. And so we start asking whether the same principles apply to other cognitive skills. And so with this, we started the UC Riverside Brain Game Center for Mental Fitness and Well-Being. And what we're doing here um, is it's a nonprofit university-based research center. And we're looking at a lot of different domains. So not just vision, but we're also working on hearing and attention and memory. Um, we're working towards things like happiness and well-being. And that we're trying to, you know, research, you know, what are the approaches that might be best for each of those domains, test them out, and then also disseminate um, kind of the evidence-based approaches that we develop. And so right now, um, we have a number of free downloads on the App Store that are kind of, you know, prototypes of games that we've developed in some of these domains. And so just kind of a, you know, highlight of some of the areas that we're working in, you know, um, besides vision, a big question is, you know, can we train memory? Um, you know, Memory is, I think, probably even larger problem for a lot of us than vision. Um, and, you know, it's as simple as, you know, what was the name of the person? What did I park? You know, what am I supposed to get at the grocery store? To um, you take people who have um, more serious memory loss and that it can be really debilitating. And what's difficult is that there really are not any accepted approaches to improve memory. And going back to um, this working memory training program I showed you at the beginning of this end back um, is that you know, this type of procedure um, you know, has shown some promise in um, transferring outside of the training domain to other tasks like fluid intelligence. So this would be like a standard IQ task. And it's one that is being used by um, a number of different companies as an ingredient in their training programs, you know, including, you know, Lumosity, you know, has an MBAC, CogMed is more based upon a span task, which is kind of a similar type of working memory approach. But the difficulty is that in the field, there is not a lot of evidence of real world transfer. And part of it is that the studies haven't been done to look at real world transfer in an effective way. Um, but Part of it, as I said, is looking at the outcome, but part of it is that, you know, most of the training is looking at very simple stimuli and very simple tasks and are of the elf that one might expect to get a little bit more specificity. And so what we're looking at is, you know, what are the ways you can improve this? And so some are looking at trying to add more reinforcement and attention to the games. Others are looking at a diversity of stimuli. So instead of only having a task in simple shapes or only on spatial locations? Um, can we increase the number of stimuli that you're doing a memory task on so it might more appropriately span what you have in the real world? And not just use um, a single task, but can we have tasks that look at um, you know, the number of things you can remember or how well you remember each of them? Or updating is like the unback where at each moment you have to remember something new and forget something old. Um, or learning associations between stimuli. And then the other bit is really working on design so that when you create a game out of this, the elements of gamification add to the training as opposed to just distractions from it. And so, you know, to highlight, you know, some of the games that we have, the first working memory game we came out with was Recall the Game. So this is actually a free download in the App Store if it starts playing. And so here you have And so what we're doing here is that all the stimuli are fuel pots. And so you're gathering the distraction. And in this case, I'm playing a three-back task. So everything that matches what was seen three items ago, you have to stop. 
And what's nice about this game is that in fairly simple ways, we vary the diversity of stimuli. So we have sounds and we have shapes and we have colors that you're doing a task on. And also we're able to vary the load of the non-memory task um, arbitrarily in relation to the memory task. Because when it comes down to it, most of the time you're using memory, you're doing something else at the same time. And so if you get better where you just train doing memory, um, it might not transfer so much when you actually have to do memory in conjunction with other activities. And so based upon that, we've come up with other variants. So remember B is one where it's pretty similar, but you're B pawning flowers rather than a spaceship you know, shooting targets, and some people like that better. Um, we have a new game that we have a prototype called Recollect the Game, where not only do we have an end back task, but we also have, in this case, a span task. So how many items can you remember? Or this is a multiple identity tracking task. We have to remember the colors of these bugs when they mask the colors and then um, you know, drag them to pollinate these flowers. And so we're both looking at you know, how to make more engaging games, but also with each game, you know, how do we train across a broader space? And so with this, the other thing which we're doing is trying to do serious science. And so we have um, a grant from the NIH, um, this is myself and Susan Yaki at UC Irvine, where we're going to train about 30,000 people on this task, where we train them on different variants. And so we're able to look at um, essentially how different training approaches might have different benefits for different people. And so I think that there's a huge issue in terms of individual differences um, and realizing that you can't treat everybody the same way. Um, we're also looking with training hearing. Um, and so with, we look at the auditory cortex, we know a lot about how it responds to different tones, um, but also more complex sounds. So if you look at, this is a spectrogram of the word lock versus rock. And what you see is that on the x-axis you have time, the y-axis you have frequency, and that you have um, a very complex stimulus space with things changing across time. And what you find is that auditory cortex responds really well to these frequencies that change over time. And that in the case of L versus R, they pretty much only differ in this third band of frequencies called the third formant. And this is actually one of the explanations why native Japanese speakers have trouble understanding L's from R's. And so if you've ever say, heard someone say um, lice instead of rice, it's because they're not very sensitive to um, this frequency band in the language context. And so what we're doing is we're isolating these types of stimuli as part of an auditory basis function. And they sound like this, but that's going down. So that would be like the lock. And we created a game called Listen, an auditory training experience, where it does similar things to Ultimize, um, but in the auditory domain, where you have this width. If you listen when the sound goes down, you have to go down. When it goes up, you have to go up. And then with this game as well, we adaptively measure people's auditory performance, and that we make the game appropriate to their level of hearing. And our first target with this game is we are training um, veterans with traumatic brain injury who have normal audiograms, so they could re hear our tone just fine, but they have understanding um, that's impaired in complex auditory tasks like speech or listening to music. And so going back to this promise of brain training, research does show that the brain is plastic throughout the lifetime. So you could train people on tasks to get better. The challenge is that learning is typically specific to the training circumstance. So this issue of teaching to the test is a big problem. The solution is if you take knowledge of neuroscience and psychology, this can provide principles that can be applied to create you know, more robust and generalizable learning. And so you know, the real issue, though, is that the science has to be done right. So we need to come up with the right principled training approaches, and we need to come up with the right studies to really evaluate the outcomes of those. Um, and once again, this is why I started the Brain Game Center. And since I'm out of time, um, I'd like to thank the many people who um, are a part of this research and you for attending.